Hello, uh, welcome to a CAPES uh, or Clinician and Patient Education Series known as Understanding and Managing Pain and Fatigue in Spondyl Arthritis and Psoriatic Arthritis. My name is Philip Meese. I'm a uh, rheumatologist based in Seattle, Washington, and I'm pleased uh, to be uh, moderating this program today. This is brought to you by uh, several organizations that are noted in the bottom of this slide. Spartan, which is a spondyl arthritis focused um, clinician education and research association based in the United States. GRAPA, Group for Research and Assessment of Psoriasis and Psoriatic Arthritis, which is focused on psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis and is a group of uh, over a thousand uh, internationally located dermatologists and rheumatologists. And then two uh, patient service organizations, the Spondylitis, uh, Spondylitis Association of America and the National Psoriasis Foundation, both based in the United States. This program uh, this evening is part of a series that we're conducting. Previously, uh, we focused in on pediatric psoriatic arthritis and spondyl arthritis. And this program today will be followed by two other programs. One uh, that's focused on uh, the newer treatments that are emerging for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis and spondyl arthritis. Uh, and one that's going to be uh, uh, focused on wellness uh, and uh, lifestyle, uh, which I think will be quite interesting to you as patients with this condition. Uh, this is all being made possible by an unrestricted grant from Pfizer. Here is our agenda for today's program. Uh, after uh, this intro, uh, we'll proceed into a, a, a presentation that I will be giving on uh, pain, uh, the uh, neurobiology of pain, how it's assessed, some, something about its treatment. And then uh, shifting uh, to uh, Professor Choi, uh, uh, who joins us uh, from Wales, where he is a chair in the Department of Rheumatology at Cardiff. Uh, and he has been a long-term researcher of the, pro the problem of fatigue, as well as pain and inflammatory arthritis condition. Uh, and then we're going to have two patients share their stories with us. Uh, Mignonette or Minnie Wilson, who comes to us from North Carolina, uh, and Melissa Leolu, uh, who, uh, although raised in New York, is currently uh, living in uh, a medical student at Stanford uh, in California. They have had longstanding psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, uh, and in Minnie's case, uh, significant uh, spondylitis as part of her overall condition. They'll be sharing some about their experience, but also uh, participating uh, with uh, Ernest and I in a panel at the end in which we'll be entertaining questions from you. And we encourage you to put uh, your questions uh, into the appropriate place on your, on your uh, panel there uh, for placing uh, questions, uh, as well as just having a general discussion. So let's uh, uh, plunge into talking about pain uh, first. This is a, a cartoon uh, that comes from the 1600s when Rene Descartes and others were uh, really profoundly uh, capable scientists at the time who had already well understood much about human anatomy, in this case, neuroanatomy. And we're showing uh, uh, here uh, someone who's putting their uh, a foot near a flame uh, and uh, experiencing that as a painful ex experience based on uh, the sending of uh, a signal through uh, wiring, if you will, in the nervous system to the brain where it's translated uh, as a pain. And then that uh, sends, uh, gets the body to go through an action of withdrawing the foot from the flame. All of this happening in literally microseconds. We now have a much more sophisticated idea of uh, the neurologic system in the body uh, and realize how complex it is. 
So not only is there the basic wiring of the neurons that are transmitting signals from the exterior into the brain, uh, but also uh, from the brain uh, to, uh, to the periphery uh, and uh, all of the, the things that we do, thinking and cognition, uh, uh, our motor movements, our sensation, all of this is being managed uh, in these microsecond uh, transmissions of signals through the, through the neurons. And this is influenced by a number of different uh, uh, elements, including, for example, um, our, uh, uh, what our psychosocial and health status is, our focus or attention on the sensation that we're experiencing. Uh, it's very changeable. It can, it can uh, it be influenced by changes in uh, gene expression and, and um, all kinds of uh, factors that, that change things. Pathologic input, meaning what if you have a disease that affects the nerves, such as diabetes, or what if you have a uh, autoimmune inflammatory disease? Uh, uh, all of these things will end up ex influencing the nervous system. Here is a somewhat simplistic view where we're showing you uh, that uh, less than uh, in the lower right, uh, there are peripheral nociceptors, as they're called, the sensory fibers uh, that detect a noxious signals in the case of the flame, for example. This sends a signal uh, through the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and up the spinal cord via these uh, neurons, uh, which are like telephone wires, only instead of electricity going through them, it's a um, uh, uh, through uh, certain neurotransmitters uh, that are being expressed in the, uh, in the neurons and being released from one neuron to another. And they have uh, names like NMDA, NMDA glutamate, substance P, nitric oxide, which are transmitting noxious uh, stimuli. And the brain perceives these up in the insula prefrontal cortex uh, and uh, immediately uh, recognizes this as pain. Meanwhile, there is a, a descending pathway that's noted in red, which uh, has an a modifying effect. Uh, it helps to inhibit this being uh, perceived as just a humongous uh, problem, uh, and, and and it helps uh, keep the sensory input uh, uh, sort of uh, in uh, in a tempered fashion uh, by uh, inputting various uh, nor nor neurotransmitters to the ascending pathway, such as norepinephrine, serotonin, something called GABA. And then endogenous opioids, uh, as well as endorphins, cannabinoids, and so forth. So this is a finely balanced system. And what, what we're going to learn later on uh, is that when you have a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disease or chronic painful condition, there becomes an imbalance in these two pathways with too much of the noxious ascending side and too little of the descending side. We also now know uh, that there are many, many neurochemicals and receptors in these nerve bodies uh, that are transmitting information. And here is a list of just a few of them. And these are, as it turns out, going to be potentially targets for the uh, pharmaceutical industry to go for in terms of developing newer and newer pain medications that don't have some of the negative uh, aspects of the narcotic opioid pain medications. As we go more centrally, uh, we now in, uh, see the influence of glial cells, which are uh, important cells that, uh, uh, that moderate uh, the signaling that's going on up into the central nervous system. Pain is the primary complaint of virtually all rheumatologic diseases. And here's a listing of some of them, and you will recognize the ones that you have as patients, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, bundle arthritis, lupus, and so forth, but also more mechanical issues like uh, uh, neck and low back pain from osteoarthritis, regional pain syndromes, uh, and fibromyalgia, which we're gonna get into more in a moment. We know uh, that when we do exercises in which we're trying to identify what are the key elements 
of a condition like psoriatic arthritis, uh, we of course are assessing in clinical trials of diseases, of, excuse me, of new treatments for the disease, the musculoskeletal disease activity, the skin disease, uh, physical function, and so on. But pain is a central item uh, that must be assessed in each clinical trial when we're developing a medication uh, for treatment of the disease. And it's considered very important by patients. And this is uh, amplified by a study that we conducted uh, in three different cities with patient focus groups led by a medical anthropologist. And of course, arthritis, which, represent, which means partly pain, but also pain itself are ranked high by both uh, uh, clinicians as well as patients as being an important aspect of their disease state with fatigue ranked just after that. And then if we turn to the spondyloarthritis condition, uh, which is, if you will, a cousin of psoriatic arthritis, but predominantly affecting the spine and, and not uh, with skin disease such as psoriasis typically, uh, we also see here that a mandatory uh, uh, domain to be assessed in all clinical trials of treatments for this condition is pain. So thus denoting that it's an important item. However, here is a survey that was done as part of the American College of Rheumatology Pain Management Task Force, in which they found that many rheumatologists are uncomfortable focusing on pain as part of their treatment. Uh, in medical school, most were not taught how to evaluate or manage pain, and most approach pain by concentrating on what is it that I can do to control the inflammation of say psoriatic arthritis or axial spinal arthritis, but not so much about specifically focusing on pain itself. And are there additional things besides trying to reduce the overall inflammation of the disease in order to manage pain in our patients? Are there ways that are not harmful, like you, I consider use of opioids to be harmful? What are non-harmful ways uh, or new new medications that are emerging, or techniques such as acupuncture uh, that can be brought to bear to try to treat uh, the, uh, the pain that a patient is experiencing. There are a number of ways that we assess pain, the simplest being just to ask the patient on a scale of say zero to 10 or zero to 100, how would you rank your pain today? Now the patient may say, well, you mean, pain where? Do you mean pain in my worst joint or pain in my back? Or do you mean, uh, and are we talking about pain just right now that we're sitting here or over the last 24 hours or over the last week? So these are all questions that need to be clarified by the clinician. Uh, and then the patient rates where, where their pain is. And that goes into the equation that the, the clinician is thinking about, about am I, are we adequately treating the, the condition in front of us? A numeric rating scale is another way where you just on a zero to five or zero to 10 scale rate the, the, the degree of, of pain. And then what, what are the ankle anchors? Is it no pain at all? Is it the worst pain you can ever imagine, like passing a kidney stone? These are some of the, the aspects of assessment. Uh, I, I just alluded to the time span of assessment being important. Uh, worst versus average pain. And then in some clinical trials, we use what are called composite measures, where we try to get at different aspects of pain by asking multiple questions that all bear on pain, such as the brief pain inventory or the promised pain interference and intensity scales. Here's an example of a table from a presentation I recently did on a, on a new drug that is being developed for a psoriatic arthritis called brepacitinib. It doesn't really matter what the drug is because uh, virtually every trial that we've ever done with any of the treatments that you're on, whether it's one of the TNF inhibitors like Humira or one of the IL-17 inhibitors like Cosentix, there's always this kind of table where we see what the disease severity is at baseline of the patients that are in the trial. And here we see on the, on the row that has to do with pain that patients rank themselves 
around just shy of 60 on a scale of 100. So pretty, pretty significant pain on average. And as you can see in this trial, it was pretty well balanced between the different arms of the trial that were being, of the dosages of medication that were being studied versus placebo. And then this is a typical outcome set of graphs where we uh, are showing the improvement in pain uh, uh, at various time points, week 16, week 52. We're also showing uh, with the facet F score there, uh, improvement in fatigue. So it's important that we be documenting what kind of improvements are occurring as we're using uh, or testing new drugs. Here's another one. This is a, a drug known as ixekizumab or TALTS, uh, which is an interleukin-17 inhibitor used to treat both psoriatic arthritis as well as psoriasis and axial spinal arthritis. And here you're seeing different uh, measures of pain, joint pain, spine pain, spine pain at night, and so forth, and showing improvements, uh, of, uh, showing better improvements with the drug than with placebo. So those are typical kind of data that we show in, in clinical trials and show that we are improving pain. But it's an over, that's a very sort of blunt way of assessing. And here is a more sophisticated methodology that was that is where we're having growing interest in. This is known as mediation analysis, where we're, we're looking now at the drug tofacitinib, also known as Zeljans, and it's from one of its trials in psoriatic arthritis. And um, we're asking the question, does this drug only work on improving pain by decreasing inflammation as measured by uh, the CRP, which is a blood measure of in inflammation, the swollen joint count, which is a, if you will, a measure of inflammation in the joints. And what was found, interestingly, was on that only about 25% of the improvement in pain was uh, through uh, the control or improvement of CRP and swollen joint count. Three quarters of the reduction in pain was by other pathways, raising the question, well, maybe tofacitinib is having a direct effect on those neural pathways that I was just speaking about uh, a moment ago, uh, uh, which is actually kind of novel, that maybe these drugs are, are not just controlling the inflammation, but also doing other things to try to improve pain. One of the other fascinating aspects of this uh, work that we've been doing with this drug is that it appears that some of the effect is through itch pathways. And so in patients with psoriasis who are bothered by itch, maybe that is also a neural pathway by which we can control pain. This leads to potentially new hypotheses about development of new medications that can work in these pathways. Now, I'd like to take the final uh, part of, of these co comments to introduce uh, to you this concept of central sensitization or nosoplastic pain. And there are several term, uh, uh, terms that we're going to be using here. I've already mentioned two of them. Two others are the word fibromyalgia and then a phrase chronic widespread pain. These are all um, uh, terminology that have to do with uh, centrally mediated or centrally experienced pain that's different than the peripheral inflammatory pain that's being generated by inflammation in joints, for example. So here we have an, uh, an older study uh, done by Rick Raceley when he was at the University of Michigan, and it shows us that when you give a stimulus like pressing with a device on a finger, we call it the thumb smasher, uh, and the investigator can put different amounts of pressure on the thumb. Uh, and here we're showing that over on the left-hand side of this graph in the upper left, we're, we're showing that in that gray uh, square, uh, a relatively low stimulus intensity of about two kilograms per centimeter squared. Uh, and the uh, patient uh, who is a normal individual is experiencing a relatively low level of pain intensity. Then if you give a much higher amount of pressure going up to um, 
uh, let's say four, um, almost 4.5 on that dot, dotted line, that normal individual is experiencing much more pain and it's showing up in the brain in these functional man magnetic resonance imaging as a painful stimulus. But then take a patient with fibromyalgia, just with a low level of stimulus, they're experiencing a high level of pain intensity and they're lighting up in the brain in the, in the proper places. So they really are experiencing that pain. So there's something different about their neurophysiology that makes them much more sensitive uh, to uh, this particular pain stimulus. Here's another experiment where uh, we're looking again at uh, MRI scanning of the brain, and we're showing that even without an external stimulus, patients with fibromyalgia have a kind of turned on chronic signaling uh, through these neural networks in the brain uh, as if their brain is on all the time uh, and uh, that this contributes to their pain experience as well. Now we know that there are lots of reasons that some individuals in the population tend to have more pain sensitivity than others. Down at the bottom, there are a bunch of genes that are uh, that are there listed there, and we know that by, if if there's a certain genetic profile in an individual, they're more likely later on in life to develop this this increased pain sensitivity. We also know that there can be many factors in their upbringing. Uh, they sort of uh, perhaps had emotional distress uh, during childhood. If they have a tendency toward depression or anxiety, if they have a problematic uh, autoimmune uh, ongoing disease, for example, or a chronic pain state, uh, this can all lead into uh, an increased proclivity to fibromyalgia. Here we have a table uh, that shows uh, the fact that in patients with different kinds of autoimmune diseases, uh, somewhere between uh, 15 and 30 percent uh, will have evidence of concomitant fibromyalgia along with their rheumatic disease. There are various ways we assess for this, including in clinical and in, uh, in research studies, these various uh, uh, questionnaires that are given to patients. Uh, we're now doing this as part of a large registry study that we're doing with psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and there are also more objective ways like quantitative sensory testing or the MRI imaging that I showed you earlier. What difference does this make? Well, here we have a study that was done in Israel in which a total of 73 patients were assessed and the investigators thought that 60 of these were PSA patients uh, who did not have fibromyalgia and 13 of them who did, which yields a percentage of 18%, right on with what we were discussing earlier. And if you look at some of the measures of disease activity in these patients, you'll see that uh, uh, with some of these measures like that have acronyms like CPDI or DAPSA, are about twice as severe in the patient group that has fibromyalgia as compared to the patient group that doesn't. Uh, now, there are a few measures that are more objective, if you will, like the blood test CRP, an inflammation marker, where there's really no difference between the two groups. The skin score, which is more objectively defined, our swollen joint count, they were about the same. So really, they're true inflammatory biologic disease activity was about the same, but there was an amplification because of the, uh, in the patients with FM in those um, measures that had subjective elements like how much pain do you have or how much uh, is tenderness do you have in your joints. The one other point to be made here is that if we look at this line called MDA, this is achievement of a, of a target of treatment called minimal disease activity, where everything has gone quiet after effective treatment. And we see that nearly half of the patients without fibromyalgia were able to achieve this particular criteria state, whereas none of the patients with fibromyalgia, again, partly because many of the items that are in the minimal disease activity criteria are more subjective. 
So even though objectively the patient may have gotten to a good place, they didn't get there subjectively. Here is a, a similar kind of study uh, in patients with ankylosing spondylitis done in Brazil, where again, we see that patients with fibromyalgia, again, representing about 15, 16% of this population, had twice as severe uh, disease activity measures as those without. And again, much of this is based on subjective answers to questions. Here is my last uh, little uh, study to show to you. And this is a study done in France in which uh, patients were uh, with uh, axial spinal arthritis were being started on a TNF inhibitor. And uh, we expected to do a pretty good job in controlling disease. And here we're uh, dividing the patients into those that were considered to have fibromyalgia, uh, uh, who were 31% of this particular population and those that did not. And we find that if we're trying to get to a state of low disease activity, which is this thing called the ASDAS, less than or equal to 2.1, or remission uh, of less than or equal to 1.3, we see that m many more patients who didn't have fibromyalgia were able to achieve these thresholds as those that did. But one of the other fascinating things that I find in this study is that at baseline, whereas 31% of the patients were considered to have fibro, uh, at the three-month mark, 18% did. So it's as if effective treatment of their underlying uh, axial spinal arthritis, in this case, lowered the likelihood that their central nervous system was firing up uh, this increased pain sensitivity. So it appeared that at least here, there was the ability of the, of the uh, uh, immunomodulatory medication to modulate their fibro experience. Now let's talk just a moment about treatment. So here I have listed all of the various therapies that many of you know about uh, for psoriatic arthritis. And, and, and uh, the uh, uh, starting with anti-inflammatory medicines like the over-the-counter ibuprofen or Aleve, corticosteroids, which we don't like to use too much in PSA, and then the various immune moderating medications like methotrexate, uh, and then the biologics that we come to know and really are very effective, like the TNF inhibitors that are listed here. These are all their uh, generic names. You know them as Enbrel, Remicade, Humira, uh, the Symphony, or Simsia. There's Ustekinumab or Stellara here. Uh, there's Secukinumab or Cosentix, Ixikizumab or Tals. There's Guzelkumab also, uh, uh, or Brisenkizumab, uh, known as Trimphaya and Skyrizi. Uh, there's Abatacept, and but there's also Otesla here, Oprimolast, and the various JAK inhibitors. All of these medications are very effective at reducing the inflammation of the condition and in treating pain as I showed you earlier, via their, their ability to control inflammation. But there are a lot of, and many of the same drugs, I would say, are used for axial spinal arthritis with some exceptions. But there are also a number of different uh, uh, approaches that don't use medications. And I've listed many of those on the left-hand side. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, conditioning exercise, physical therapy and massage, acupuncture, biofeedback, and others. These are used uh, for management of pain uh, as well as fatigue uh, in our diseases. And then there are some uh, medications that are specific for the phenomenon of fibromyalgia or central sensitization, including, for example, medicines that were originally developed as antidepressants, duloxetine or Cymbalta is an example of that, anticonvulsants, an example of that is pregabalin or gabapentin. Some of these you'll recognize because you may have tried them. Uh, your doctor may have used them for uh, uh, to try as a non-narcotic way of treating pain. And there are many, many other medications on the, on the way uh, that are currently in development at uh, pharmaceutical companies. Now that we know more and more about the specifics of the neurologic pathways that we're targeting. So in summary, uh, we've been focused on no, learning that pain is a cardinal feature of rheumatic disease. 
impacting function and quality of life. The neurobiology of pain is complex and involves genes and environment and sociocultural factors. Pain assessment is important and theoretically you're doing it each time you go in to visit your clinician. Concomitant fibromyalgia or nosoplastic pain and central sensitization influence the way in which you experience your pain. And treatment should be targeted to whatever your main complaints are, but using not only anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory uh, treatments, but also non-medication approaches as well. So with that, I'll uh, wrap up my comments. And <clears throat> I would like to, uh, uh, what I'll be doing is stopping sharing slides and uh, Professor Choi uh, from uh, Wales uh, will be uh, sharing his slides uh, next. Thank you, Phil, for that introduction. So I'm going to share my slide. Okay, so I hope all of you can see my slides. If you have a problem, uh, please flag it up and we'll try to resolve the technical uh, issue. So uh, after that wonderful uh, presentation by Phil, it's my task to discuss with you about fatigue in inflammatory arthritis. And I think the first thing to say is much of what I will be talking about is probably uh, relevant for all types of inflammatory arthritis. It doesn't matter whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So what I will try to address uh, in the next 20 minutes of so is to explain how fatigue become a core measurement uh, when we do research in rheumatic diseases. Uh, I will explain at the moment our understanding of what may cause fatigue in patients with inflammatory arthritis, how we should assess fatigue, and last but not least, how to treat uh, fatigue. So fatigue really only come into the prominence uh, at the turn of the century, really. There's a global group called uh, OMRAC, Outcome Measure for Rheumatic Diseases. And this is a global research effort to reach consensus of what we need to assess or measure in clinical research. And at the beginning uh, of the century, um, the group started an initiative of trying to get patients' perspective and input into the research agenda. The aim is to develop research that meets uh, the needs of our patient to do what we call patient-centered research. Now, during that uh, working uh, group discussion, it became really clear uh, that fatigue is a very important symptom uh, in patients with inflammatory arthritis, uh, including rheumatoid arthritis, just as Phil has shown for psoriatic arthritis. So the group uh, agreed that fatigue should be measured in clinical trials and clinical studies. Now, at that time, although we reach an agreement that fatigue is important and we accepted that, we don't really understand what causes fatigue, how we should measure it, and how we should treat fatigue. So the working group actually developed a research agenda trying to address uh, these questions and the result of the working group uh, are what I'm going to share with you during this uh, webinar. So first of all, uh, it is absolutely clear what patients tell us uh, are, are correct. So this is a study showing that fatigue in patients with psoriatic arthritis significantly impact uh, on their quality of life, regardless of what you want to measure, be it pain, mental health, uh, the number of tender points, uh, uh, the physical functioning as measured by HEC. So it is clear that it is a question that we must uh, address and develop treatment for. Without coming in, going into great detail, it is also clear that fatigue is not caused by a single biologic effect. Fatigue is complex, and in inflammatory arthritis, there is good evidence that, in fact, fatigue can be caused by inflammation. It is associated with distress, 
uh, and also uh, has an impact on the psychosocial functioning uh, of uh, the individual. So how should we measure uh, fatigue? Uh, for a long time, uh, rheumatologists has borrowed uh, questions that are used in other conditions like neurological conditions, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, multiple sclerosis, or cancer in order to measure fatigue in rheumatic diseases. None of these uh, were developed specifically for patients with inflammatory arthritis. But recently in Bristol in the UK, they have developed a specific questionnaire that measure fatigue in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis called the Bristol Rheumatoid Arthritis Fatigue Questionnaire. And this questionnaire has two versions. Uh, on the left is what we call the MDQ, a multidimensional questionnaire. And this questionnaire has 20 questions and it covers many different aspects of fatigue, from the severity of the fatigue to the impact of fatigue, both on physical activity emotional impact, as well as uh, cognitive uh, impact. Uh, but obviously, a 20-question uh, questionnaire is quite long. So they have also generated uh, a version of this questionnaire, which only has three questions. And in the main, on the right, this breath VAS on numeric rating scale uh, system would capture how severe the fatigue is. And depending on whether you want to use it for research or more detailed assessment, you can use either version of these questionnaires. And in fact, this questionnaire has been validated uh, in patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis, and it really shows very good uh, performance uh, in patients with psoriatic arthritis. So in, in, in patients with inflammatory arthritis, I think in the main, this questionnaire would be preferred nowadays than uh, to the other uh, fatigue assessment methods. So uh, last but not least, we need to address how we want to treat uh, fatigue in patients with inflammatory arthritis. So two large systematic review on intervention uh, for fatigue in rheumatoid arthritis were led by uh, the OMRAC uh, fatigue uh, group one that focused on non-pharmacological treatment, the other on biologic uh, intervention uh, for fatigue. So if we look at biologic intervention uh, for treating fatigue, the Cochrane review of systematic review really conclusively show what Phil has highlighted uh, for biologic and pain, that is, the biologic treatment, be it TNF-based or non-TNF-based biologic treatment, were all able to reduce uh, fatigue in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The only thing to note is that whilst this intervention reduces fatigue in a significant manner, they don't restore full vitality or energy level. So it highlighted that while inflammation do drive a proportion of fatigue, there are elements of fatigue that are driven by non-inflammatary factors. And these leads to the notion that fatigue are multifactorial and we need to evaluate why patients get fatigue and try to choose the best treatment for fatigue in that individual patients. Alternatively, we can adopt an attitude to say that nowadays the current treatment standard is to drive inflammation to the lowest possible level, so remission. So once you have achieved remission in the individual patient, then we can look at how to treat the residual uh, fatigue. And in fact, uh, in psoriatic arthritis, similar to what Phil has shown you, 
Similar effect has been shown uh, uh, for biologic agents uh, on fatigue. So this is one biologic agent that has been used uh, in the treatment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And in the randomized controlled trial, it certainly reduced fatigue in patients. And in fact, uh, the mediation analysis that Phil mentioned before for pain also applies to reduction of fatigue in this study, suggesting that aside from reducing uh, inflammation, perhaps biologic uh, treatment have some direct effect on fatigue that we currently don't fully understand. For non-pharmacological treatment, two interventions has demonstrated a significant effect in reducing fatigue. Uh, one is physical activity. Uh, two is psychosocial intervention. And by that, uh, what these studies tend to assess is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, recently, a large randomized controlled trial in the UK called RAF have actually asked psychologists to train the rheumatology team to deliver cognitive behavioral therapy at a group setting. And these patients all have their disease activity well controlled. So these are not individuals with active arthritis. And you can see that cognitive behavioral therapy was able to reduce the level of fatigue as measured by the breath impact uh, scale. So I think we go back to uh, this diagram. I think fatigue is complex. We are starting to understand that different factors drive fatigue in patients with inflammatory arthritis, and we need to capture it in clinical setting, uh, trying to uh, decipher what factors may be driving fatigue in the individual patients and try to tailor treatment according to the need of that patient. And with that, I'm going to pass this back to Phil and my sharing, and, uh, and Phil will take you to the next agenda item on the webinar. So now um, uh, we are, by the way, getting starting to get questions and we encourage you to put in more questions and I'll come to those in a moment. But before doing so, I'd like uh, to turn the stage over uh, to are two patients that are here with us. Um, and we're going to first hear uh, from Minnie, uh, who comes to us from North Carolina. Minnie is, has been a, a longstanding patient with, uh, with psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and spondylitis. Uh, and has been a significant spokesperson for the Spondylitis Association of America. Uh, and then after that, uh, Melissa will take the stage uh, who uh, has uh, been working a lot with the National Psoriasis Foundation uh, and is um, currently a third year medical student at Stanford. So Minnie, uh, how, I wanna take it away. Thank you, sorry about that. Yeah. I have had symptoms of psoriatic arthritis since birth. And unfortunately it took me many years to get diagnosed. Um, my mother mentioned the skin rashes that I had as an infant, and I remember those rashes as a, throughout my toddler and my young childhood years. They were on my arms, they were scaly. I had a lot of issues with rashes in my scalp, my neck, my arms, and there were times that I had issues with my fingers having significant pain in them, but there was not a real reason why. It was just difficult to ride a bike and be able to participate in a lot of, you know, typical child's play like the average kid. As a teenager, around the age of 15, I started having hip pain. And unfortunately, that hip pain would go and come. And it just kind of had me thinking that maybe I was a hypochondriac because it would happen sometimes when it was raining. Um, cold weather, you know, it would be triggered by different things, but there was never a real cause. I couldn't find out anything at any of the doctors. I was easily dismissed, of course, because I was young and I shouldn't have had arthritis, you know, because the research wasn't there at that time. In my twenties, I started having that hip pain that would not go away. It was pretty consistent and it interfered with 
my daily life. I walked with a limp and then the back pain started, the relentless back pain that still has not gone away. And that went on for quite some time. So it took a while, but after um, several years of living with that in my latter thirties, I was finally diagnosed with a form of spondylitis and that helped me to get the treatments that I needed to be able to start feeling a little better. So I thought, but then my forties rolled around and everything went haywire. I experienced the worst pain that I have ever experienced on my spondylitis journey. I had migraines that were severe for days and months on end. I had back pain. My feet were in pain. Like I just, everything was just not doing well. There were times when my ribs were in so much pain. It felt as if someone had a grip pliers, just grabbing them, grabbing each rib and just to the point, squeezing it just before breaking it. And that made it very difficult to sleep at night. Um, everything that I was taking at the time did not work for me to help me get in a better place on my journey. But fortunately, I did start getting better treatments. I found a better team of doctors that worked well together and did the things that I needed. One of the things that helped me was getting psychotherapy the behavioral feedback therapy on my migraine journey to help me be able to cope with the pain that helped me deal with my overall pain. And then having my blood work checked, I was able to get some of my inflammation markers checked and noticing things that were low like vitamin D. Um, I needed more fish oil. So taking supplements to help with some of the issues that come along have really helped me battle the fatigue and I've gotten to a better place where I have a lot more energy because of that, you know, not probably not like the average person, but definitely I'm at the point where I don't need a nap every single day. I'm not needing to sleep, you know, just wanting to sleep every time I'm anywhere. So I feel like I've gotten to a better place just by uh, being able to take my supplements, um, the combination of biologics and just rest and, and learning how to live well with spondylitis. So that is my journey and thank you. Thank you many very much. And we've already had a comment from one of the uh, patients in the audience uh, uh, who says, wow, she's describing my whole life. <laughs> I'm sorry so, about that for them, I really am. Yeah. Um, Melissa, uh, take it away. Well, hello everyone. My name is Melissa Lilu, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with you all today on topics that are just so important in my life. You know, like many and many other people, um, my journey with psoriatic arthritis did begin with psoriasis. Um, I was diagnosed with psoriasis as a baby and when I was growing up, my psoriasis was already just debilitating and devastating. Psoriasis looks different for everyone, but for me, I had these thick red plaques just covering my whole body from head to toe, and the rash would crack open and bleed, which was just so painful. What I didn't know growing up is that psoriasis can be accompanied by arthritis. So when I was in my early 20s, I was living a very active lifestyle. I worked out probably every day. And whenever I experienced fatigue or pain, I just attributed it to whatever rigorous exercises I had done that day. And I think because of that, um, and because I had experienced pain and fatigue through my widespread skin symptoms, my just overall threshold for seeing a doctor was higher than it should have been. Um, I finally went to a doctor after a really bad ankle injury that just didn't heal. Um, I had essentially lost function over that joint. And through that, I was kind of forced to see doctors and ultimately talk about what was going on throughout my entire body. So ultimately, I was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis about 25 years after my psoriasis diagnosis. Now, of course, you know, we're here today to talk about um, this discussion on pain and fatigue and psoriatic arthritis. And when I think broadly about my disease management and my treatment goals, 
Um, pain has definitely been my focus from the start, but that's not to say that fatigue isn't a significant problem because it really is. Um, but for me, the general experience that I have with psoriatic arthritis is essentially the typical symptoms, you know, probably very familiar to our listeners. And that's stiffness, pain, throbbing, tenderness in my joints, decreased range of motion. And another way to just describe it simply is that my joints um, feel like they get stuck in one place. It just hurts to move. Some days it feels almost impossible just to sit myself up and get out of bed in the morning. And other days it hurts to pick up my coffee mug or use my hands. But one reason why pain has been my focus um, is simply that it poses the largest barrier to my normal function. Meaning that for me, if I can't move my joints because of the pain, then no matter how deeply fatigued I am, I'm still gonna be primarily concerned with my mobility and function, at least in that moment. But I think another important reason why pain has been my focus and my treatment goal thus far is that when we as patients describe our disease to doctors, it's really challenging to put the complete and total experience of disease into words. But pain feels more easy to understand because we've all felt pain in some way. And it's definitely a deviation from good or healthy. And it feels from a non-medical perspective, like it might even be more treatable. On the other hand, when I'm not taking any medication, my fatigue is really problematic. I could probably sleep for more than 10 hours, wake up from that tired, and even if I push through the day doing my very best, my body is still ready to collapse by the afternoon. In those moments, I find it difficult to concentrate or just function, and it definitely impacts my life but I also don't always feel comfortable talking about it. I have realized that I feel in some ways judged by people because whereas not everyone lives with pain every day, I think most people experience some version of fatigue pretty regularly. And this creates a lot of stigma around fatigue in a patient who says that they're tired all the time. And that creates kind of communication barriers between patient and provider. And as I continue to reflect on my experiences overall with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, I find myself much more comfortable talking about my skin symptoms because the rash is something that I can point to and I can show you and say, you know, this tangible thing right here is the problem. But when I talk about psoriatic arthritis, I feel the need to justify or prove that I have these real symptoms even when they can't necessarily be seen. And for that reason, I feel especially grateful to physician scientists like Dr. Meese and Dr. Choi for all of their work and research to learn about, understand, and find ways to assess pain and fatigue in rheumatology patients. But in order to do this, I will say, one of the complications is that patients and providers really need to communicate well. And certainly there are many barriers to a good working relationship um, with your doctor. Looking back to even my adolescent years as a teenager, had I known then uh, more about psoriasis, maybe that it could potentially progress and I could develop psoriatic arthritis, I would have been much more invested in finding effective treatments and routinely having doctor appointments to check in or reevaluate not only my skin, but also my joints. I really felt like education at that time was missing for me. Now that I know about my diagnosis and I understand it in different ways, I continue to advocate for myself at doctor visits by speaking up about what I'm experiencing and how my symptoms are impacting my quality of life. But I'm a bit sorry to say that I still don't always put 100% of my faith into doctors alone. And I am so sorry for saying that. But like many patients, I feel like, you know, I'm willing and have tried every possible remedy and treatment that I can get my hands on no matter what it may be, and that often does not come from the doctor. So from diets and cleanses to herbal remedies, teas, and acupuncture, there is a very low threshold for me to try something new, even if it's the tiniest chance that it could help me, I will definitely do it. Ultimately, as I've come to understand my disease, the dangers of my disease progression, I have tried um, a variety of different medications and not all have been effective for me, but I currently do take one that's helping a lot. And while going through different treatments has felt very frustrating and sometimes very disappointing, um, maybe even a little bit scary, 
I'm glad that I did keep trying to find something because the relief from pain and fatigue is just definitely worth it. Um, with that said, I still continue to take a very broad approach to my health, a lot like what we heard about today. Um, while diet isn't a treatment for my symptoms, I do my best to take care of myself as much as I can with the hope that reducing inflammation from lifestyle changes and diet will supplement and support my medical treatments. With all of that said, I am so excited for new research and investigations that are interrogating the relationship between pain and fatigue, particularly in the context of joint disease. Because I think as we learn more about what's happening within our bodies in a scientific way, it'll be more targetable with treatments and there will be more awareness about pain and fatigue in patients like me. Thank you. And back to you, Dr. Meese. Well, thank you both. Uh, that, the, both very eloquent and uh, quite journey, uh, quite some journey that you both have had over uh, over your lifetime, really, in both cases. Uh, and many uh, uh, just isn't it isn't it a shame and, and a problem that it took so long for you to uh, have people finally recognize what you had, and, and that was true, although to a lesser extent, with Melissa. So we, we're getting questions in, and I, we're going to try to uh, address all of them. Uh, some of them are very specific for this particular program. Others are more you know, specific to a, a particular patient. But a, a, some that are coming in are, have to do with diet and supplements. And I, I, want, to make, I want us to make a few comments about that. Uh, I should mention, though, in, in starting uh, out our, our responses to those questions, in two sessions from now, uh, the next one is on pharmacologic treatment update, but the one after that, that Elaine Husney from the Cleveland Clinic is going to be moderating uh, in uh, November, will be on wellness and uh, include discussions about diet and so forth uh, and exercise. And so I, we encourage you all to participate in that one specifically. Uh, I can make just an introductory comment, which is that not even focusing on a specific uh, type of diet um, per se or supplement per se, but there was a famous set of studies done in Naples, Italy, where uh, in uh, one group of patients, uh, th these were all in patients that were being started on what the class of medications called TNF inhibitors for their psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and one group of patients uh, continued to eat as they normally would in Naples, Italy, which is a really good, you know, really good food, by the way. I don't know if you, any of you have been there. Uh, but the other group um, went on a very strict hypocaloric diet where they lost weight. Uh, and uh, they would they lost about 10% of their body surface uh, of their uh, weight over the course of a six month period. And what they discovered was that the group that had uh, this weight loss um, had a much more likely uh, chance of achieving this state of minimal disease activity with their, with their TNF inhibitor. They did much, much better. So when, it, when a patient asked me, doc, is there something that I can do diet-wise? One of the simplest ones is simply being able to lose weight. And, and we know that there's a gen genetic proclivity in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis for patients to be uh, have a, a greater risk of having obesity, not because they're of their dietary choices or because they're overeating, but just because the genetics kind of are pushing them there. And so uh, they try, have to try harder in order to lose weight. But losing weight can lead to some improvement based on uh, the, the experiments that have been done thus far. Uh, I'd like to turn ba back over, though, to Minnie and Melissa to hear some of your comments about uh, Minnie, for example, you mentioned uh, fish oils. Um, and I, I know there is some science around showing that omega-3 fatty acid supplementation uh, in, uh, in our diets can lead to various improvements, improvements in heart disease, improvements in autoimmune disease. Any comments you want to make about that and how you approach that? Um, I definitely follow the advice of my physician on all of these things. And so I think that uh, one of the things I noticed is I've had 
high cholesterol, which is hereditary, but I've seen a difference with that. It has also helped me with the autoimmune dry eye, which comes along with spondylitis or inflammatory arthritis in general. A lot of us have to deal with that, but my um, eye doctor has seen a difference with me taking it twice a day. So it's had benefits for me with in different directions for overall health. I can tell a difference when I don't take it. I, I At first I'm like, you know, what's the difference? And I take it sometimes. I'm like, I don't want to take this big pill, but there's a difference in the lab work. There's a difference in my dry eyes. There's just a difference when I don't take it. And so I know that I need it and it's, I have to take it just like I have to take a biologic. I need it in my system. So twice a day. Yeah. Melissa, any uh, comments? Yes, I'm actually, I'm so grateful to engage in this conversation because I think when I was a patient, um, early on, I really felt like there was a, a, a dichotomy where there were physicians who would say, this can be totally managed by diet. And then there were physicians who would say, you'll never get better without medication. And I've come to see that these ideas are really not mutually exclusive. And just as we heard in the presentation, you know, patients do best when there's a multifactorial approach. And that's exactly the experience I've had in my own life. Before I tried medications, I went on very strict diets. I would read books, do my own research, you know, Dr. Google at its best. Um, and when the diets didn't work for me, I felt a real sense of shame. I felt like it was my fault or that I could be doing something better. Over time, having conversations with my doctor and learning to incorporate both herbal remedies um, supplements, diet, and exercise alongside my medication allows me to feel empowered as a patient, but also get the real help I need from a medication because ultimately it's not fully in my control. And I was just born in a way where I have psoriatic arthritis. Right. There's also a question from Kurt about vitamin D uh, supplementation. Anybody want to address that? Ernest, do you have any comments about vitamin D? Well, we know that there's a very recent uh, trial of vitamin D supplementation uh, in healthy individuals. And in that study, it shows that vit vitamin D supplement supplementation reduced the risk of developed uh, autoimmune disease in general. So I, I guess there's... Um, um, some enthusiasm about taking a vitamin D supplement. Do you know of any work related to people that already have established vitamin D uh, and the um, uh, and any amelioration of, of disease state? Um, so there's been um, the history about vitamin D uh, insufficiency and immune disease and fibromyalgia has. There's a long history of this. Uh, and at the moment, it doesn't look like that if you have true insufficiency, uh, the vitamin D supplementation can improve your symptom, but the effect is relatively small. So it always needs to be used in the context of effective anti-inflammatory treatment in the individual patients. So on its own, on its own, um, it, it has an effect, but not a huge effect. That echoes uh, what Melissa was commenting about, there not being mutually exclusive approaches. Um, we've got several, a number of comments here, which have to do both in the question uh, portion, but also in the patient chat, which is a separate line, which basically says that people are searching. Uh, if I can summarize that is people are commenting about having tried three, four different medications and now in search of a fourth that will, uh, since they're failing on the first, uh, on the third of the first three. Um, and um, I think this is something where uh, we, we are dealing with this every single day in our practices where patients are coming in who have had a great run for one, two, three, four years with a medication, but now it's starting to flag. And I, I liken it to just the um, 
uh, old uh, Pony Express where you'd have stations along the way with fresh horses and uh, you'd, you'd trade out your horses and go on out and deliver the mail. Uh, and so I, I think that this, this is one of the things that we know with autoimmune disease that you need to keep trying different, different ones when you fail. But I, there was one comment here about somebody who's been on um, uh, uh, Humira since 2017, wondering how long can you take it? And the answer is you can take it as long as it's effective. Uh, we don't have any evidence that there's a limit you know, in the old days when methotrexate was the only thing that we had available to us, and I can remember keeping tables where we were calculating how much, how many milligrams of methotrexate the person was getting for their psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And after you got to a certain point, you're supposed to either stop the medication or at least get a liver biopsy to show that it wasn't harming the liver. Those days are, you know, faded behind us. We don't do that anymore. Uh, but we, uh, but that's where the idea that there was a limit on how long you could take a med. But these these days, with many of the newer medications, uh, that's not uh, necessary at all. There's also some questions that have to do with specific new medicines coming along. For example, someone has raised the question about uh, the new drug bimikizumab. So bimikizumab is a uh, in the interleukin 17 family of medications. It inhibits IL-17A, similar to Cosyntex and TALS, but it also uh, inhibits IL-17F, which we think has a role in disease as well. And so um, we're very much uh, eager to see that drug getting approved uh, in the United States. It's already approved in certain parts of the world uh, and, uh, and using it in our patients. Uh, along with uh, 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 the way in which we're using IL, uh, the other IL-17 inhibitors. Um, I'm going to just, this is a personal one. Uh, uh, one of my patients is saying, where the heck is my bow tie? <laughs> <laughs> and so for the, most of you, you don't have any clue that the fact that I, for for decades, I was uh, part of my attire was wearing a bow tie. Um, it started when I was at a boarding school as a as an adolescent, and uh, we had to wear ties. And I started wearing bow ties then. But um, during the pandemic, Rose, I've been um, got, gotten a little bit more informal. Uh, uh, so you're probably going, alas, that's too bad. Uh, so, uh, but now I'm self conscious. I'm thinking, oh shoot, I wish I'd had it by my side because I could have whipped it on very quickly. Uh, so um, uh, here's one, um, uh, uh, Ernest, I'll toss this one to you. Have there been any studies done with patients with AS who had COVID-19 and taking Cosentix? And I can make a comment about that as well, but you start off. Uh, did you mean on the effect of uh, fatigue? No, just, I think the concern was this is a person who is on Cosentix and they, so this isn't specific for pain or fatigue. It's just okay. having to do with COVID-19 safety yeah. in the, in the oh, context of Cosentix. Oh, for safety. Oh, I, I think Phil, I saw your uh, paper on, on the topic uh, using US data and we actually have the same data in Wales that we have published. So actually patient with psoriatic arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis don't have a greater risk of having more severe COVID. If anything, they tend to have a lower risk of more severe disease. The main reason is the patient with psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis are on average much younger than the overall population in general. And in fact, none of the biologic treatment, be it TNF inhibitor, consentic IL-17 inhibitors, increase the risk of severe disease at all. And that mirrors what we found. We, we've studied... Um charts of about 9 million patients in the Providence Health Network that I'm that our um, hospital is part of. Uh, and uh, out of those, about 300,000 patients with autoimmune disease. And what was found was just what Ernest said. It looks as though virtually most of our autoimmune diseases, but particularly psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, uh, don't uh, um, either lead to more likelihood of getting COVID-19 if you're exposed to it, uh, any uh, risk for severe outcomes like hospitalization or death, 
uh, and or uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and the medicines that, that patients were using, including Cosentix, did not increase any risk. Uh, also, when patients are getting their various vaccinations and boosters uh, with the IL-17 inhibitors like Cosentix, we don't, uh, or TNF inhibitors for that matter, we don't uh, recommend any adjustment of treatment relative to the timing of the uh, of the uh, vaccination. It's fine to get the vaccination whenever. There are some guidances around methotrexate and the JAK inhibitor class, but um, we can get into that in more detail at, uh, at another time. So um, let's see, I'm just scrolling down to see uh, there's lots of positive comments. Someone who made the, I think, comment that is only very realistic, which is it's great to advise a patient about weight loss, but harder to achieve uh, oftentimes. Uh, and uh, we, we understand that. Uh, so um, uh, here's a person who is um, uh, trying to get, get on the right track with medication when we don't know which inflammation marker is flaring and we have health insurances that don't seem to want to work for us. Mm. Is, isn't that the... Uh, the truth. Um, I know that um, in the U.S. we have a lot of issues with, with insurance companies sort of guiding us down a certain path based on the cost of medications, and we don't have the full choice, it seems, unless we really fight for it, uh, of which medication that we as clinicians want to use or you as patients want to take. Um, uh, in terms of uh, Knowing that getting on the right track, I think it's it's really a matter as um, both Melissa and many have emphasized, uh, being able to have open and transparent communication with your clinician, speaking to each of the various clinical domains, whether it's arthritis or skin disease or spine disease uh, that or uh, nail disease, which is the most active part of your disease state. Um, I, labs and x-ray have something to do with evaluation, but really it's listening and taking a careful history and physical and knowing whether or not you're getting adequate benefit from your current treatment and then figuring out, well, hmm, you've already been on two or three different anti-TNF medicines, so maybe it's time to switch to a different mechanism, uh, like an IL-17 inhibitor or an IL-23 inhibitor or a JAK inhibitor. So these are all things that are going on in this sort of computer brain of your clinician uh, as, they're, as they're listening to you and balancing the issues of efficacy and safety in their minds and then sharing those, those considerations with you and, and making a choice and then handing that off to the person in the office that uh, is in charge of getting approvals by the insurance company, which... Uh, so I, I, I'm on a daily basis, I'm checking her hair to see how much hair she's pulled out the day before <laughs> from uh, sitting there on hold with insurance companies while waiting to talk to somebody to, to plead to get uh, a, a particular uh, medication for them. Um, oh, boy. So, Ernest, I'm going to have you start with this one, and then I, I'll make a comment. This is a patient, uh, Pamela. I have AS and PSA, so it sounds like many, where she has uh, both PSA but also very significant uh, uh, axial involvement. I have taken all non-steroidals, disease-modifying drugs like methotrexate, steroids, and three biologics. Nothing works anymore, and my rheumatologist has dismissed me Oh, because he has nothing else to give me. What do you have for us older patients who have tried everything? Um, so you want to start I, off? Well, uh, I, ha I have to say, I, I feel a little bit sorry uh, for the patient. Um, 
And we have uh, seen patients who are refractory to many biologic treatments, although I don't know exactly the detail of that, but increasing the new class of uh, oral medication actually can work both for psoriatic arthritis and axial spondyloarthritis, like ankylosing spondylitis. Um, I don't know, Phil, did you, uh, do you use the JAK inhibitors for yes. these patients? Because that, that, yes. that is my first thought. If you have failed several uh, bar, so-called biologic, then this targeted synthetic DEMA would be the one that I would definitely opt to, to go with. Right. And, and, and uh, with just three biologics having been tried, there are, there are multiple others. So for example, there are yeah. five TNF inhibitors. There are two currently available IL-17 inhibitors, two currently available IL-23 inhibitors. So sometimes, even though you've tried one medicine in a class, uh, you don't necessarily assume that another medicine in the class won't work. So it seems to me that there are multiple options that you're, uh, that a rheumatologist may have to try, and and so I don't I wouldn't give up yet. Yeah. There, there's also another, uh, but it sounds like you may need to go shopping for a new rheumatologist if you're having trouble with. Uh, with one that's sort of closing the door to and not patient to work with you on on trying different things. There's also another person here who's tried even more medications of many classes and ha- and running out of options. So I'll mention a couple of things. First of all, and uh, there is a study that's just a starting in which um, two bi- different biologics are being used together. Uh, an interleukin-23 inhibitor and a TNF inhibitor. Uh, that's um, Trimphaya and, and Symphony are the two treatments that are being used as a combination and then comparing them uh, to the IL-23 inhibitor alone for treatment of psoriatic arthritis. So this is one of the first forays that I've seen by a pharmaceutical company uh, to take the step, a courageous step, to look at uh, combining two two biologics. What's the reason why it's a courageous step? It's because you run the risk of having more adverse effects like infection. And then that uh, is is kind of tarring the overall good data that you have for either one alone. But I think it reflects the reality that there are many patients out there like you who have tried many things. And so now, like cancer physicians, we're starting to get more creative with combining and putting together two different medications. We do some of that, I will acknowledge, in the clinic off-label. Uh, there's, there's really not an approval by the FDA for using two of these sophisticated medications together. And insurance companies sure don't like it because it's expensive. But if you use one that's relatively safe, has a very low infection rate, along with one that might be uh, um, not quite as safe, we we are are starting to experiment with that sort of thing. So I think combinations, um, as well as some of the newer mechanisms of action that are that are being developed uh, and are still uh, in in the research phase, I think there's more to look forward to in the future. Um, do you all want, Melissa or Minnie, do you want to make any comments about, I hopefully you're not, neither of you is in this position yet, but um, uh, I'm wondering if you have any comments for these individuals. Sure, I'm happy to make a comment. I It breaks my heart when I hear this. I um, have not been successful or not found success on every medication I've taken. And each time it feels devastating because you know, you go in with so much hope and maybe temporarily experience that relief. And so, you know, when the disease flares and comes back, it's just, it's it's not only physically painful, but it's emotionally devastating. And so I think it's just so fantastic to engage in these conversations, know that patients are heard by our physicians and researchers, and that while there may not be a definitive answer now, there's so much research moving forward new treatments coming out. We're understanding more about why this is happening. And I think that, you know, we're already seeing how um, medicine is changing and I have so much hope for the future and and hope that we can share in that patient experience together. Um, 
Damien has asked about CBD. Uh, it was listed on one of my slides, and uh, so I, I'll at least come, make a brief comment about it. Uh, so I, I live in Washington State. It was one of the first states to legalize uh, marijuana, for example. So we, uh, we, we have um, now two stores that are on every block, a Starbucks and a marijuana shop. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of, a lot of my patients, you know, their, their mothers, their fathers, and as a Christmas gift, their son or daughter gets them CBD uh, jelly beans to eat or salve to put on or tincture to sniff. Uh, and so um, some of my patients swear by these. They, they, uh, they, they don't get the high of but they don't aren't bothered by the the uncomfortable out of control feeling of getting uh, marijuana but they there is this um, um, a cannabinoid effect that can have a pain relieving effect interestingly there was a study done in Denmark that was recently presented at one of our meetings and because uh, it, this had become legalized in Denmark recently they, this group was in, interested in it and so they did a placebo controlled trial, uh, giving a, an appropriate dose of a CBD compound uh, and then placebo uh, in treating patients with knee osteoarthritis and psoriatic arthritis. There's about equal number of patients in each group. And what they discovered was there was a significant treatment effect, significant reduction of pain, and it was equal in the placebo group and the CBD group. Okay, where is that placebo? I want some of that. <laughs> and so um, it's, uh, if you're looking on the negative side, you'll say, well, uh, didn't beat placebo, so not effective. On the positive side, it had a significant pain improvement effect. And so I'll, I'll leave it to you to make a, a, a decision on, on what to try. I don't think there's any harm at all uh, in trying the various preparations that there are out there. Uh, another person has commented about the fact that they have Crohn's along with their um, spondyl arthritis and psoriatic arthritis diagnosis. It sounds like this, this person has a real triple whammy going on with spine, peripheral disease, and gut uh, disease as well. So there are, that, that is a special situation. Many of the drugs that we have uh, are using for treatment of psoriatic arthritis or axial spinal arthritis are effective for Crohn's disease. For example, the TNF inhibitor class, and now more recently, we're learning that the JAK inhibitor class can can effectively treat both, and the interleukin-23 inhibitors can beneficially treat both. A problem with the interleukin-17 inhibitors is that they have the risk for flaring Crohn's disease, so there's a bit of a restriction there. But um, And it looks like she has combined a TNF with an IL-17 at one point. I hope you didn't get a flare, flare of Crohn's, and an anti-TNF with one of the JAK inhibitors. So she's already, it looks like, uh, in an experimental mode with her rheumatologist and gastroenterologist. And we, we do that a fair amount where the gastroenterologist will prescribe one medication like in TVO, for example, for the gut, and we will prescribe another medicine like a TNF inhibitor or uh, a um, VAC inhibitor for the musculoskeletal. And that, that sometimes we can get away with that where there's two different clinicians that are ordering the two different medications. And I, I think that you're doing the right thing by trying some of these combinations. Uh, but uh, um, uh, boy, here's another person with the same issues that's just come in. Uh, and I think what, what need, you need to do is just keep trying. Uh, just keep keep at it. Keep, keep your situation in front of your rheumatologist and gastroenterologist to, to keep trying. Because I think um, we we potentially can get there, or, or at least for a while, help you. Boy, there's a lot of activity in this uh, question, this chat. 
So do, do you think I can give a comment on this? Because in fact, please um, do, please do. This is, this is actually a project that I'm involved in at the moment because of that common strand in biology of how this inflammatory disease may be caused by similar uh, biologic uh, pathways. Actually, uh, there's a European group that are working together to try to develop personalized medicine and we are taking genetic and blood samples from these patients and try to identify what may be driving the different conditions in the same patients. And then we are putting it into a supercomputer to analyze the data to come up with a combination that may work. And we were trying to do what we call a basket trial. So we're actually going to put these patients into a single study and test whether the 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 these tests that we do can predict which combination of biologic medicine will work for them. Uh, so finger crossed, we may have an answer for these patients in a few years. Oh, uh, I'm I'm loving now the patient chat. Here's one: we have Starbucks on both sides of the street. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and here's one person who's already commented in the, in the question and answer area where she said that uh, her, her rheumatologist is Dr. Ogdi at Penn. So that's great. Uh, she's a very good, um, very good uh, rheumatologist. Uh, there's a question here about low dose naltrexone. Um, Ernest, unless you have a comment about that, I'll just comment that this this is something that some of our patients bring to us as a question about using naltrexone. Naltrexone is a medicine which is a is used for um, sort of countering the effect of opioids. Uh, it, it's used to salvage patients when they have an a opioid overdose. And uh, it, it has been used in low-dose format for uh, pain management uh, as a kind of a safer opioid receptor-affecting medication. And so when patient, we, we don't think, uh, perceive it as being pr problematic in terms of any side effect issues. Uh, there's not been great controlled research on it, but there are plenty of anecdotal comments that it can be helpful for patients. So we do have some patients that are using that approach. Ernest, do you have any, or many, or Melissa, do you all have any comments about that? that this exactly the same as your experience, really. I would like to add that I am actually on low dose naltrexone and it is um, a very, I would say it's a very good pain medication. To me, it is the best one that I've used. I prefer to stay away from the narcotics um, and the stronger meds, but I needed something to help me. And when I had my knee replacement last year, I was able to get through with ibuprofen and the naltrexone, the low dose naltrexone. So I, I stand by it, and I'm glad that I've discovered it. And it's also helped me lose a little weight. All right. Okay. Well, this has been a very stimulating Q and A session and discussion section. I must admit, uh, you all are just terrific out there. So um, uh, I will. Uh, that we're, we're approaching the. Uh, end of our time. We really appreciate the fact that you all have stuck with us for all this time. We've had a record-breaking number of people attending uh, and, and really are um, appreciative of that. It shows that there's a lot of interest in this topic area. I'm going to just quickly share my screen uh, to show you what's coming up next. Uh, so here is some uh, in this series that we uh, is coming forward. We've got some podcasts coming along. Um, uh, release date September 29th for for clinicians and for patients September 27th. Um, and I'm assuming through this same uh, portal that you're uh, coming to us today with uh, to learn more about access to these. And then uh, on October 5th and October 19th, respectively, there will be a patient and clinician-focused uh, uh, webinars 
on treatments. So this will be focused on uh, a quick review of our um, of the guidelines uh, for treatment of spinal arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, and then drilling down into each of the kind of medications that we've been speaking some about tonight, but, but just in more detail about their efficacy as well as safety and strategies uh, for their use. Atul Diodar, uh, a rheumatologist from Portland, Oregon, is going to be uh, moderating uh, these sessions. I will be one of the participants and a, a Harvard physician, Jorg Ehrman, will be uh, participating as well, along with several patients. Uh, then on November 3rd, there's going to be a patient-focused uh, fo uh, webinar uh, entitled, Does Changing Health Behaviors Help Your Arthritis, Lifestyle, Myths, and Solutions? And it's, I think it's going to be a terrific program uh, led by Elaine Husney from the Cleveland Clinic, who's had a lot of interest and focus in this area. Uh, so we're totally uh, uh, pleased that you uh, took the time to attend today's program. Uh, and on behalf of the sponsoring organizations, Spartan, GRAPA, Spondylitis Association of America, National Psoriasis Foundation, and our uh, uh, funder, uh, Pfizer, uh, we are very appreciative of your attending. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>